Hi, I'm Nile Rogers from the Group Chic and a bunch of other stuff, and I'm here at the London Acoustic Guitar Show, having a damn good time. Um, I would think of myself mainly if I had to choose one role. I would think I'm a composer, but if I had one profession, I would just like to be a guitar player. Like, I would just like to show up every day and have somebody tell me what to do. And I could just do that and then go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, especially when it comes to um, being able to deal with theory and um, and the way that I play extensions now um, in the course of doing a regular funk song. Great example, Daft Punk, Lose Yourself to Dance, right? Uh, so when they first played the track for me, if you take away the guitar part and just listen to the track, doesn't sound like, you know, just but when that thing goes, and I could do the voice it and go and then even do it on all of I can keep that same voice leading through all the chord changes. Can you show that? Um, no, I don't remember the song. Okay, <laughs> I just funny. I just know that I just know how that uh, yeah. um if I if I could hear it I would remember. That, but, cool. but um um but that's the point, is that that's, that's what I'm talking about, being a guitar player, where a person yep. comes in and says to you, uh, well, I have a song that goes like this, and you go in and you do what they say to do, and then you add your own technique to it, and all of a sudden, that thing you did, they can't live without in a way. Like, in other words, if you just play, um, you know, the simple chords, yes, that's the basis of a song, but once you put your lick to it, it's that lick, it's that, that, that thing that makes it so special. When you take that lick away, all of a sudden the song isn't doing that thing anymore, even though harmonically it's the same chords. No, not really. What I do, though, is that I do try and... Um, uh, the, 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 I do try and accentuate the important part of the rhythm of any groove. So typically, I'm always playing 16th notes um, with my right hand. It's always, so if I didn't play any note, uh, you would hear this right hand going. So it's always doing that. But that's not interesting. So if I'm playing a song like Good Times, you hear me go, ooh, B oop, am I into? I played the wrong note. So this guy is, and the only reason why I'm not going, it's because I save that for when I do a fill. Yeah. So my part is. And if I do a fill, and I wanted to keep the 16th going, I'd probably do something like that. You know, something like that. Yeah. But uh, I try and establish uh, the basis of the song. And just like a piano player does, like a piano player is always embellishing the song. Um, and that's, like I said, it just hit me this morning that that's what I am. I'm the right hand of the piano player. I love that when you said it. Yeah, it just, it just hit me. That's what I do. It, um, because uh, when, when guitar players, if you look at a band, and you see a guitar player play the song, look at their hands. It's almost 
Like once they learn the song, if they're going, you know, that that's what they do every time they go. But a piano player would do, or yeah. you know, or all sorts of, yeah. you know, because they would just do that sort of thing. That's what I do. I always am, am embellishing it. I'm always trying to make it sound interesting. And as the band gets to a crescendo, I'll go, <laughs> and, um, but that's not how most people play. Um, and honestly, it really just hit me today that I, I, I'm a frustrated piano player because I, <laughs> I don't have enough stuff. I only have six strings. <laughs> To me, my style of funk um, is is based on playing groups of three strings at a time and not uh, playing too much information um, on any stroke. And the reason for that is because on the second stroke that follows it, I can invert and make it sound almost like a clavinet or something like that. You know, once again, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm a frustrated keyboard player because I can only do, if I played, if I played like most guitar players, if I tried to play good time when, I, when I'm playing with other people and I'm watching them go, and I go, no, I'm going, but, but that's because they're hearing. Yeah. Um, or, you know, it's um, to be able to, so even though you see me fingering five strings here, well, actually I'm fingering all six because I'm muting the low, the low E string so that it doesn't resonate, especially because I'm on a seventh fret. So you know there's a, a big harmonic happening there. So I really am concentrating on these three when I go, when you hear the first part of the lick, but the second part of the lick are these yeah. three, right? So it's which is basically a triad again. But what makes it cool is in the overall function of the tonality of the chord, because the piano has the other part of the voicing and the bass, I'm just playing the motion that's defining the voice leading and that's what sort of makes it sound funky and cool to me so by doing that just three strings at a time so it's all fingered but you're really just hearing i mean i could just play the three you can see that it sounds the same as if i had all six okay you see it's precision i'm just doing that yep And then, like here, right? All six are fingered, but you don't hear. You only hear. And right here, all six are fingered. A full 13 chord, but you don't hear. You hear. It's. So that's what I call funky. Matter of fact, when I was learning to play funk, and I used to go to Miles Davis concerts. I was a pretty young guy. And I used to hear him say things like, you know, man, it ain't the notes you play that count. It's the notes you don't play. <laughs> and I think what he was trying to tell the guy was like, you know, do your stuff sparingly, but make it hip. Um, I guess, you know, who knows what Miles means. Um, but when I would hear that stuff as a kid, I would take it to heart and say, wow, yeah. It's stuff I don't play. Like I don't want to just always beat people up. I don't always want to, you know, you know, just, you know, just, you know, I don't always just want to. <laughs> yeah. Uh. I don't. It's like I don't want to do that all the time. Oh, it's fun. I love it. I love doing it. I love it. 
And I love playing, you know, with guys that we play like that. But I notice that when they start doing that and I start countering them, all of a sudden we both sound better um, because it's the interplay between, how do I say it? It's, it's um, I don't know, maybe it's like playing doubles in tennis or something. Yeah. It's like I like to be a collaborator. I like to be part of a team. Yeah. And, um, and when I first started playing, I used to be like that. I was a soloist. I was in a, a, a rock band, and yeah. that was all about me being the guitar player. I couldn't wait to go loud, 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 woo, woo. And, and, and you know, I come from the hippie days, so we're feeding back, and woo, and you want to be Jimmy, and woo, woo, woo. And even now and then, you know, you'll come to a chic show, and you'll still see, I won't play with my teeth. I've, I stopped doing that. <laughs> But every now and then I'll, you know, do the trick or two and, you know, pull the thing over my head and, you know, because a lot of people don't understand that so much of playing um, fast with guitar is the fact that you can do it right here. You don't even need to pick it. It's all, it's there. It's all there. So if you have an amp and the amp is killing, you can just go. Yeah. You point at the crowd and go to home. And then they're all like going, woo! And they go, woo! And you know, it's like, it's all right there in the left hand. Right? And then so when I add the right hand and they flip out, it's like, yeah, well, you know, it's all just because you're doing. And then if you do, if you do something like we're doing, and you're pulling off and you're doing. You know, all things like that. You put it through a Marshall or any lamp that amp that's killing. Yeah. It sounds like you're like Eddie Van Halen. And then you, you mix this in. Oh, well, man, you're killing. Yeah. So, um, but I've learned that in my style of music, that has now become not as important to me. Um, and it's not as important to the person who's listening to my music. And that's the thing is that it's a sort of ego right sizedness that you that I've learned to achieve because when I was younger when you go and you listen to my early recordings of my early bands ugh we're just all over the map because uh, we grew up in the fusion era yeah. so we wanted to compete with those guys and we're out there just playing and playing and playing um, and there's some funny stuff on online you can see me playing with my band right before we became chic and we're playing a BG song and basically um, we're a trio yeah it's a quartet I'm not dissing my friend Caleb but you can look and see he's just like here you know we, we actually asked him to play with us because he was the one white guy and we were trying to get jobs at colleges <laughs> bring the white guy in but you can hear them really, the song is really happening between just three guys yeah. me and Bernard and Tony um, and all the parts that you hear on the Bee Gees record is really, it feels like we're playing, you know, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it took a long time to learn how to, um, to say that the music is not about me, mm -hmm. it's really about you guys, um, and to learn to compose in a way that the compositions are not about me, yeah. it's about the listener, because the compositions that I do that are about me, yeah. you rarely hear. I love them, I listen to those tapes all the time. Yeah. I practice, when you hear me practice, you wonder why I'm practicing that stuff and I never play it on stage. Like people wonder, like, why is he practicing that? Why is he practicing those weird diminished scales? But we never hear him do that. Uh, the other day, I think it was at festival or whatever. I was a little bit sad, and for a minute, I was overindulgent. I played this thing, and I went off for a few seconds, uh, maybe even a few minutes. Uh, but um, the people who come to hear my music, they came to dance. They came to dance, they came to have a good time. They want to hear musicians that interpret the music well. Um, but it's, it's really about the crowd. And I'm, I'm, 
so happy that I've learned to to care about other people, even in my music, because I was socialized to care about other people. Yeah. But when it came to music, music is such an individual thing. Mm -hmm. When you learn it, the smarter you get. Believe me, man. Every musician who listens to me right now knows I'm telling you the truth. The smarter you get, the more you want to show people how smart you are. <laughs> and you actually think that that means more to them. Now, every now and then it does. Every now and then you get Eddie Van Halen like playing a solo like Beat It. And it means a lot. <laughs> it means a whole lot. Um, but... You don't want to hear a whole Michael Jackson album like that. You want to hear it on Beat It, and that's <laughs> just fine. So it's learning the art of balance. Um, and as I get older, because I'm learning more now, right? So I know how to play more on the guitar at the age of 62 than I did when I was 16. Because as I get older, I go, oh man, I didn't realize that I could do this. And to to a person's ear, they're going to hear it as this chord. Because when I was younger, I was hung up on, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think that as I get older, the compositions get a little more interesting, but a little less, a little less selfish. Like I just finished doing this uh, song with Nicky Romero um, that we were originally writing for David Guetta. And... Uh, it's a show-off piece. I'm showing off. I really am. But it was an accident. I wasn't <laughs> trying to show off. Um, Fender had decided, after years and years of trying, I, I realized that they finally got my guitar, my Nile Rodgers hit make it right. So they sent my guitar back to me, and I wanted to just see if the guitar uh, played all the way up and down the way I'm accustomed to it playing. So I just started doing simple little exercises and stuff like that, and just making sure that the sh that I was lighting over the strings the way that it normally does, and and I did this lick that I had never played before, and I went to to get it. I said, David, get the engineer in here. Let's record this thing because I'll never remember this because it's not part of my normal thing. I'm just you know figuring out if this is my guitar. Anyway. Um, I, we couldn't get the engineer in, so Nicky Romero was sitting on the sofa. I recorded it into his laptop. <laughs> Finally, the engineer came in, and I didn't stop playing it, so I kept playing it so I would, wouldn't forget it. <laughs> yeah. So by the time the engineer came in, now I got it down. I can play this thing all day long. So Nicky Romero and I just went off and, and turned it into That's cool. this piece. And I have to say, man, I am really proud because it shows me that EDM is developing in the same way that jazz and R&B and other musical art forms develop. Now, when this song comes out, you know, Geta walked in and he said, wow, guys, you know, that's really avant-garde. And both Nikki and I looked at him and went, really? <laughs> this is cool to us. And I said, David, I swear to you, to me, this is pop. All we got to do is write a pop song on top of it, but underneath, I mean, I'm going to write it down. Yeah. <laughs> we transpose and start doing all sorts of stuff and changing all the timbers while we're playing it, and I'm playing it up here and playing it down there just so the sound is different. Um, and it's almost like a fusion band. Right. But we're playing EDM. This is made, this is written to make people dance. Yeah. But it's hopefully taking them to a higher level, um, because I believe music has to evolve. It, you know, it just can't continue to just be bum 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 bum. I was like, all right, already. You know, <laughs> give me another four chords. Yeah. So uh, okay. we did a modal EDM song, and the only time harmonic information comes in is when we go to the break. And the break is this beautiful semi-classical break, yeah. and it's just pretty. It's beautiful, and then we get out of it, and then we we develop the lick part of it even more, and it just goes crazy and crazy and crazy and crazy. And then finally, we put a raise nine chord in this thing, and it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you you putting a raise nine chord in an EDM song? 
it's just it's like the most ridiculous thing ever but it somehow spiritually and artistically really works and if this catches on I feel and this is a big statement but if this catches on I think that you'll start to hear EDM composers start going wow people are not offended by this type of harmonic yeah. development and this type of melodic development. They actually are feeling it. Yeah. As long as we got that four in the floor pumping, yeah. they're going to start going, yeah. okay, we can hear more than those four chords too. Great. Just one more question, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to know why your late great colleague Bernard was such an amazing bass player and how, how you two lock together? I know it's a big question. Uh, the, the, uh, the simple reason is because he was a genius. Mm. The, the practical reason is because he started out as a guitar player and he had this 16th note thing in his playing, in his guitar hand. So when he moved to the bass, he still had this. So he didn't play 16th notes like this, and he could, but he loved to play 16th notes like So he, he would always go. And he would And that's how he played. He play. You can look up and you can see close-ups and you see like the blood start dripping from his fingers because he's now like, I can do it on a guitar like this, but man, when I play it on the bass, when you hear me imitate Bernard, it sounds like it, but I can't do a whole show like that. No. So he plays like that when he's playing 16 notes and then he switches effortlessly. He's playing and he switches like that. Um, He's the only bass player in the world I've ever seen do that. Yeah. Only one. Um, and I think that that thing of the continuous 16th note chucking sound between Bernard and myself is what made Chic so unique. So you have the hi-hat going and you have the guitar and the bass going but the accents are just going so it's like a train just going and it's just relentless um, and that's what our music is it's it's relentless in a kind way we're not trying to beat up on you we're actually being kind <laughs> but <laughs> it's relentless. You, if you see a live chic show, you see we're we're pretty over the top, um, in a controlled way. Wonderful. No, thank you so much. Thanks. That's I hope really this great. Makes sense. That's really great.